recording that unfortunately i didn't notice that my microphone was muted so almost after one hour 15 minutes lecture i have realized my microphone was completely muted so that's why i need to go for a retake so possibly that's why in the second lecture you will see some portion i have got little faster some portion i have elaborated separately so have you noticed at all have you considered the lecture have you gone through the lecture anyone if you have any query just feel free to ask today any feedback any comment about the lecture or any kind of fundamental doubts so that's why what i need i need continuous uh, interaction from you such a way i will be able to know whether i am duly connected or not can we start our today's topic yes sir okay so today basically last in our last class uh, in our recorded classes we have talked about the luminier photometry so that means uh, especially we have already defined the classical definitions of luminiers how we can define luminiers what are the fundamental functionalities of the luminiers because uh, the luminiers are the equipment which will help you to redirect the light in your desired position at the same time it will be working like an optical as well as electrical enclosure electrical circuitry whatever we have especially for the hid lamps we know the ballast or choke will not be sufficient because the intensity of discharge demands a very high voltage so that's why we need to, need to have a sort of impulse generator so that's why igniter will do that job it will generate an impulse uh, so that's why basically it's a capacitor which is charged in a normal way and its discharge path is getting controlled using some thyristor based circuit so that is a simple principle of our igniter so there are the different type of igniters based upon how they are electrically connected so today our concept is not to talk about that but here the igniter the ballast sometimes we need to input the power factor for the hid lamps so that's why we need some some sort of other elements like we need to use capacitor power factor correction capacitors so those all are very much essential to be introduced in um, our box which will encapsulate the all electrical components because mostly the luminaires will be placed in outer atmosphere for the outer luminaires even for the indoor luminaires they will be recessed within the ceiling so it's not possible that every time you have your close monitoring neither access to the control gear assembly so keeping that issue in mind it is very clear the luminaire is a very very important part of their lamp will not going to help you for this case in our luminaire photometry classes we have talked about that that how the photometric parameters are required to characterize a luminaire we, it was very much if you have already seen i hope those who haven't seen the lecture definitely will see that so they will find the components are very much specified with the three different applications the indoor outdoor and the outdoor is further classified like street and area or flat light there are several sub classifications which i haven't mentioned because that is very much specific area even under sports sports lighting which is a very specialized form of lighting design so that needs a different sub classification to the based upon the type of sports and uh, the nature of the sports so here fundamentally in our case we will be mostly concentrating today concentrating upon the photometry so that's why you should not get confused with our previous lecture today we are going to talk about how we will be going to do our light related measurement so that's why it's very unfortunate that i can't take all of you to our laboratory because otherwise the photometry concept will not be realized so possibly in our previous few classes i have shown you this photograph this is a our advanced photometry laboratory it's a complete dark room we possibly in our previous classes of laboratory classes we already have talked about the necessity of dark room here we are very much keen to deal with the direct lights here we don't have any more intention to take care of any reflected and interreflected lights in our measurement so that is duly required to be shielded so that's why it's not only a perfect dark room and also 
should definitely ensure that the nature of the surface should be very much matte type in finish. It should not be very much shaggy. So uh, this term already we have mentioned earlier that there is a two term, one we call photometry and another we call radiometry. So the main such is that once the amount of energy, whatever we are measuring that comes as light, that means between 380 to 780 nanometer, we call it a photometry. So all the parameters like luminous intensity, luminous flux, luminous flux density, the light distribution, all will be calculated, all can be measured using the photometric sensor. Mostly we know it's starting with a very low cost photo, photoelectric sensors like LDR, light dependent register. If you go to Chatham market, you will see 10 to 12 rupees maximum per pieces. Whereas there are the photo multipliers, we have photodiodes, we have photo transistors. We also have the high grade sensor like charge couple devices. We have the very high grade sensors like CMOS. Because today, uh, throughout the globe, there is a tendency that photometric measurements are becoming much more digitalized with the help of different cameras. So that's why the camera is getting used very much for sake of photometry. How? Uh, today, once we'll be talking about the photometry, I will share my own experience uh, uh, to all of you. Radiometry, it's very clear that once we will be using a sensor, who is not capable to measure only the light, so beyond that. So that's a radiometric part. CCD is a very good source of radiometric measurements also. So it's if it is confined within the light only, then only the question of photometry will come. If it is going beyond that, then we will be dealing with the radiometry. So if radiometry will talks about maybe the IR, the heat, it may be dealing with the any other form like uh, sometimes the ultraviolet. So in our laboratory we have UV meters. So those are the UV A, B, C dedicated three sensors which are used to measure the UV A, B, and C. Those are coming under the radiometric devices. So. Here, we'll be going to measure the similar or the equivalent parameters of photometry. So, just like luminous intensity, we have a radiant intensity there. No matter what wavelength or frequency actually we have. Is it clear now, the radiometry and photometry? Yes, sir. Next is a... The term many times I've mentioned, the visual photometry versus physical photometry. So it's a very simple that in our class two level physics laboratory, we have used mirror, prism, lenses, but human eye as a fundamental sensor. That is what we call visual photometry. So human eye as a sensor. But on the other way, today we are, especially with the electrical engineers, are planning to replace the human eye with a photoelectric sensor that comes under the physical photometry. The sensors already have told you that India for transistor drives. So those are basically dealing with the physical measurement. That means we don't need any human interferences. Definitely human interferences are required to operate the equipment. But we don't need human eye as a sensor. So if you ask me to compare that two type, it's fair. The visual photometry is the best one. Why? Because that's all about the light related measurements are mostly all about the human eye. No matter how accurately you are developing your senses assembly, but your eye will give you, giving you the best result. So that's why the visual photometry is the best one from the eye measurement point of view. But at the same time, the discrepancy is that it is very much individualistic in nature. Just like me, I have spake, many of you have spake. So if you are going to do some uh, visual measurement, that result may vary. So that's why here we need to get some physical measurement for which no matter whether you are measuring or measuring, if the experimental conditions are even fixed under this condition, my physical photometry data will be absolutely remain unchanged. So that is the actual beauty of the uh, physical photometry. But at the same time, uh, while we are talking about the physical measurements, I think you will be able to recall that we already have talked about the B lambda and B test lambda curve. Can you recall that? The photopic and scotopic human eye sensitivity curve. Yes, sir. 
So that's basically the human eye characteristics which are standardized. That may differ also between individual human beings, but we can consider this to be a, a fixed uh, benchmark. So if we are going with this physical photoelectric part, it is very difficult to ensure that eye characteristics in your instrument, photoelectric instrument. Because mostly, you know, the instruments are the three fundamental components are there in the instrument. The number one is a raw sensing element, the LDR, photodiode, photodiode, CCD, CMOS, no matter what type, that is a raw sensing element. Then we need a dedicated optical filter. So once the light will pass through that filter, that will get forced to maintain the human eye characteristics. Why we need this thing? Because unfortunately, our photoelectric devices, neither of the photoelectric devices will help us to replicate the human eye characteristics. So that's why we need to take a help from an additional optical equipment. So just an optical filter, just, you know, a piece of glass. So once the light will pass over that, this will help us to get rid of the problem. So that's why this is a simple piece of glass which can help us to get this dedicated characteristics. So this is what we call V lambda filter. If we are tending to the photopic human eye characteristics. Now, if we are talking about the photopic, we will be using a V dash lambda filter. So, but the thing is that the accuracy of the filter is always questionable. Because once the light will pass through the filter, we are allowing to travel in a such a way, the gradation of the wavelengths will be such a way, finally the light, whatever will reach to the sensor, it will be already replicating the human eye characteristics because of that filter. Regarding that, I can share one of my experiences. That is not to tell you that how much reach we are Electrical Engineering Department of the University, but um, just to tell you a comparison, we have a lux meter generally we do use for all of our measurement. Even in our electrical laboratory this semester, what we were discussing through this last week. So that particular taste and standard lux meters, whatever we are using, that was mostly a low cost lux meter, cost around 4,000 rupees. Whereas uh, today, in my this slide, I will be showing you some lux meters which have, we already have. That is a German company manufactured, which cost in a range of 10 lakhs and above. Just see the price difference. Just to tell you that why this, the high-end lux meter can measure many more parameters. This is not the reason only. Another very important, the accuracy of the human eye characteristics. I can recall a couple of years back, um, with of one one my student, we were planning to develop some kind of, you know, the instrument to measure the light. So while we were working that, we were very much struggling with the, this V lambda filter. So that's why I asked him that let's open a damaged filter, uh, lux meter, remove the filter, and if we can use that in our instrument to validate our equipment. So let's try it. So once I have removed. Let me tell you very frankly, with this low cost Chinese uh, lux meter, I really couldn't find any kind of filter. Though they do claim that they are using a sort of jelly kind of filter over that which cannot be made dissociated with the sensor itself. But whereas uh, during the days I was in TU Berlin, uh, so just next to the TU Berlin campus, there is a German company, LMT, whose uh, reference I was mentioning to all of you. I was visiting their laboratory. And I have seen how the this V lambda filter is prepared. This is what we call mosaic filter. Unfortunately, I can't show you right now, but once everything will be normalized, I, ha I have a sample of this filter, especially the CEO, Mr. Hammer. So he has given me that to show the students how actually the patented V lambda filter, mosaic filter looks like. So right now I can't show you in this photo, if the photo it will not be able to understand until analysis you will hold that filter so that's a very very patented uh, v lambda filter mosaic in nature such a way once the light will travel to that the exact human eye characteristics at least 90 percent of the human uh, eye characteristics can be traced so that is that is why i have told you just to tell you that that's why physical photometries are lacking because 
if you have a very good accurate sensor, then physical photometry will be the one of the best solution. Okay. The next uh, sir, year, yeah, sir, uh, then uh, the the last meter in our laboratory, we measure yeah. the light. Is it yeah. is it very much? I mean, the, wrong the, wrong value. No, no, no. Actually, the thing is that it's not absolutely wrong. So that's why what I generally do. You might be thinking that, sir, why then you are using that lax meter for our experiment? Because you know that we can't use the this costliest one. But regularly, the standard what I do follow personally. Before I uh, give you the test meter for your instrument, since last few years, once we have the LMT lax meter. The day before that, I used to calibrate my all taste lux meter with respect to that German lux meter. So that's why for an entire range, I used to calibrate that data, and that's how we, I do provide. So that's why the error are always there. Definitely, I can say, but to some extent, we can get rid of, we can reduce the margin of the error because it's all about the uh, lambda filter, how accurately it can be tested in an eye. Uh, sir, one more uh, JL question. Ah, yeah. mean, uh, how we, uh, how do we know the the costly lux meter is accurate one? Yeah, that's the vital question. And that's our only option left. Like that, uh, here we need to consult the calibration certificate with which your lux meter is calibrated. So that's why if you buy a very standard, and this is what we call standard, new uh, illuminance transfer standard detector. So this illuminance transfer standard detector, once you are buying from some, uh, maybe from any manufacturing unit, they are supposed to provide you a calibration certificate. And that is duly calibrated with some standard, which was situated at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Testing. So that's, uh, NIST is basically uh, just reference which you used to use in our classical definition of luminous intensity in your physical science book maybe in the class seven or eight so there was the standard and units was the chapter so the last unit was candela so while the candela was mentioned this is they used to call cgpm that body now they have translated uh, converted to nist national institute of standards so that is situated at uh, troy so they are right now is providing the all standard photometric and radiometric standards. Just like they have the platinum black body, platinum radiator, we already have used at 2042 Kelvin temperature if we use the platinum black body. So it's a solidification temperature of that. So that is also is very much there with. Why I am telling you that reference? Because once you are going to buy your lux meter, a standard lux meter from there, you should always ask for a calibration certificate and that calibration should always be done if it is a standard one should be done with respect to the cie or nist standards and another nonce in every two years at least you need to descend that for sake of recalibration so that's the only option left to ensure that our the cost relax meter is providing the best result because otherwise you don't have any option you need to always calibrate your standard one with respect to the, the global standard one. So what global standard is there? That's why the calibration certificate is very important. In your electrical lab, I have told you that you need to plot a calibration curve. So that is why your calibration curve they are supposed to provide you for the entire range of the measurement. Okay. So that is the only option you have. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so let us proceed to the, that. Uh, this is why the CI for the photometry, linear photometry, many times I have mentioned and uh, that I have a connection with CIE as well. So this is the International Commission on Illumination. So they published some technical reports, which are very quite uh, expensive. We do buy something from our department and few as a member of CIE, I have also managed few of the technical reports, but they are very, very effective because those technical reports are to be considered like the best standard. Okay, so they are always recommending the standards. So it's all about how you are recommending your standards. Okay. So that's why 
CIE, they dedicatedly have a standard CIE 121, which was published in 1996. The photometry and the gonio photometry of the lumina. What is gonio photometry? I'll come to that point very soon. And you know, once I am talking about that, we need to mention the Indian standards also BIS. So if you already have gone through my previous lecture, I already have mentioned about this IS13383. So this is the photometry of luminaires methods of measurement. So which was published by Bureau of Indian Standard. Uh, let me tell you, being a member of the BIS, I can share with you that we are taking our own knowledge along with the CIE guidance too. So that's why this is a big guidance for all of us. Here, the example, the basic differences already I have told you, the photometry versus uh, radiometry part. So here, <clears throat> this equipment, possibly I have seen shown you earlier, right? During the spectro SPD, yes. isn't it? <clears throat> so this falls under, this spectro radiometer is a very interesting tool, very in interesting equipment because that falls under the two component. One, it is used for sake of visible measurement, though it's a radiometer because it measures the radiation which is coming under the visible map. At the same time, it measures some amount of UV as well. This spec was one to one one. GAT is a German company, so we bought it. So that helped us to measure the 380 to 780 nanometer. But before 380, a small portion of the UV it can also measure. So that's why if you Google that today, just for your understanding, the GAT makes uh, different spectroradiometer, you will see they have different ranges of spectroradiometer. And only visible range they used to call spectrophotometer. And spectroradiometer where they are basically focusing about any non-visual range as well. That is beyond the 380 to 780, above and beyond the 380 to 780 nanometer. That is for your ready references that what photometry quantity already I have told you, they have the equivalent radiometric quantity tools. Just the way luminous flux, we have radiant flux. Luminous intensity, we have radiant intensity. Luminance, we have radiance. Illuminance, we have irradiance. Luminous excitance, we have radiant excitance. So here now the term CCT, I think we are quite well aware of that classical definition of CCT. Many times during our color classes, we already have talked. But that's the CRI also, that all are coming under that photometric measurements. Though this is what sometimes, in some cases we used to call this, is, this those are coming under uh, colorimetric measurements. So that's why we used to call this colorimeters are used, but definitely that is part of today, integral part of photometric measurement too. So here the different CCT and CRI you can see. Here the different example of CCT. Uh, already we have mentioned earlier, so this is a device, this works like again a charge couple device based equipment called chromometer CL200 which is used to measure the color temperature of any source. Um, unfortunately we couldn't perform that but in uh, our third year first semester in our spectral composition experiments, isn't it? You had the spectral composition experiments in our yes, third sir. year first semester. Yes, so in that experiment we were supposed to measure the uh, color temperature of different sources too. So that's why the CL200 was very much effective tool to measure that. This was a very old analog type of CCT meter. So if any one of you are interested to perform some kind of short project to develop some low cost CCT meter, I can help you. So maybe right now I don't know whether, whether the possibilities of uh, having the sensors duly and access to the laboratory will be difficult. But if you want some kind of interesting projects on developing this kind of equipment, low cost CCT meter, that can be easily done. So here only we, what I have uh, done earlier, we have used the RGB sensor. So the Texas instrumentation, they have a dedicated uh, sensor. It's a very low cost, maximum the 400 to 500 rupees cost sensor, which is available online. So that is RGB sensor, so where it will measure the R, G and B component of a light and accordingly the frequency of the sensor will change. That means the frequency it will generate always a square wave. 
the frequency of the square will change based upon how much R component, how much G component, how much B component is present in your light source. Now, using some kind of lookup table, you can develop your analog CCTV or digital CCTV meter too. So that part we can talk earlier, but that's come under this measurement. So this is what only we have talked about earlier. I need to talk about refer this photopic and photopic again and again because you know once we are talking about the photometric measurements that will inevitably come. Just few minutes back also we have mentioned so many things. Here for the photometric measurements we need to use some standard lamps also. So that's why the three type of elements are there. One we call luminous intensity transfer standard lamp. Second one is luminous flux transfer standard lamp. And the third one is illuminance transfer standard detector. So a simple question can be asked to all of you. What do you mean by transfer? Why the transfer term is coming? It's very clear. A standard lamp, luminous intensity standard lamp means a standard lamp whose luminous intensity value for the different angles. Last day we have talked explicitly that we need to have a matrix, 2D matrix that standard lamp values are very much well known. Luminous flux transfer standard lamp, we know a source for which, light source for which the luminous flux values are known. Illuminance transfer standard photometers, that means a standard photometer, just few minutes back we are talking about that also. So the standard photometer for which the responsibility of the detector, that is how much illuminance, current power illuminance or milliampere per illuminance, that value is known to us. Now my question is that why we need to introduce the term transfer in that case. Can anyone try? Why we need to use the term transfer? Just changing to one into another it's not dealing with the unit. Actually, it is doing some very interesting things. See, we are talking about some standards. And already I have mentioned to all of you that mostly the standards are, whatever standards we have, they are placed in a very, very, very specific situation because they will be working like a standards and we will be blindly believing those data. So that is the primary standard we can call. The NIST, already I have referred that NIST in their laboratory at Troy, they have the biggest standards. Now, once I am going to develop my own standard, what will be my step? My step will be that with respect to the standard, I will be calibrating my own standard. So that's how different secondary standard, working standard, the different range of standards are getting developed with respect to that. But here, say I want to buy a standard lab. So what I'll do, I'll be buying maybe from a manufacturer because unfortunately we, we can't manufacture. Maybe the Philips, maybe from awesome. But what I need, I need to have a proper calibration certificate of that lamp for the entire range of operation. The entire range of operation for that case, which will be at par the calibrated value. So that means once NIST laboratory, they will calibrate with respect to that standard. They will be calibrating my standard lamp and they will be handed over the lamp to me along with the calibration data. That is, I will be preserving for an entire period when I will be going to do my measure. But here, one thing is that once we are talking about the lamp, once we are talking about the sensor, they are so sensitive with the physical parameters so that's why once I am taking my standard lamp from NIST laboratory at Troy to our electrical engineering department, Jadavpur University, Calcutta, the entire physical parameter has changed. The temperature, pressure, everything has changed. If I blindly believe in the calibration data, it will be completely erroneous. You might be asking me that then why we are measuring the for test equipment. I am not bothered about the test. I am talking about the standard lamp. So that means whose value will be blindly believed, so whose value will be blindly used. So that's why no compromise can be made with the accuracy of that standard lamp. So that's why while I am taking the standard lamp, standard lamp, standard sensor, 
standard photometer from one laboratory to the other laboratory, the physical parameter situation will change. So that's why we need to transfer the data. So that's why a sort of lookup table will be provided to me, such a way I can transfer, I can convert the data with my own. So whatever I have got in an NIST laboratory, with the same thing once I will take that sensor or that source in electrical in, in, in the department illumination laboratory at Kolkata. So everything will change. So that means here the parameter will accordingly change. I need to go for a conversion. So that's why the term transfer is used. Okay. So here some examples of the uh, transfer standard lamp and the detector have mentioned already. So this is uh, one of the uh, Osram standard lamp, Osram WI41G. That is a gas filled incandescent lamp. It's a very dedicated 175 watt, 30 volt lamp. So, and the beauty is that the other part of the lamp is coated with dark matte finish. Such a way, there should not be any, uh, you know, the, the clear portion will be in the front direction. So, there should not be any backward portion. Whatever light will go in the backward, that will be completely absorbed. But no light will can go from the outside. So, only the front part. So, here you will be able to see the filament. So, that's during our one experimentation at TU Berlin, I have captured this standard, awesome standard lamp they are using. Now the lux meter, already I was talking a lot about the lux meter. So this is a sort of lux meter, what we, we can use. So the unit is lux, we measure the eliminance. So here, once the lux meter we are going to use, we need to take care of linearity of the response so your response should not be very much non-linear in nature and we should take care of the color correction or v lambda correction also that, that the human eye correction so that is the lux meter i was actually talking about the lmt lux meter dc60 so this is a very high sensitive and uh, standardized lux meter see here is the sensor can you see that so this is the sensor actually. So here the sensor is mounted and here the metering part is there. So that is, can you see? Yes, sir. So this is the most calibrated by LMT Germany. So that in our laboratory, it's a very costly already. I've told you something around 11 lakhs and more. But we have to be always careful about the functionality of this particular dedicated lux meter. One very important part I need to mention while I am talking about the lux meter, we need to have a white coating. So if you see a lux meter, if you Google the pictures of the lux meter, so there also you will see always the lux meters are made with a white cap. So there is a white cap, sort of white cap list. You will never see a lux meter with a bear. Here also you will be able to see a small white cap. Here also you will be able to see the white caps. So what is that white cap? The white cap is basically we call cosine correction. What is that? Let me try to draw a picture and to explain you the simple idea of the cosine correction. By the way, do you have in your next class will be started at which time? No, I think there is no next class. Okay. okay. So uh, actually, the photometric part doesn't have too much. So I uh, I want to finish it up today. And one more thing during my ward is getting open. Uh, how long your this theoretical classes will be held? 15 March. 15 May. May sorry, sorry, sorry. May. 15 May. And once your examination will be started from third week, isn't it? So we don't have any exact news. OK. Up to 15th May, I hope I can get uh, classes, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because uh, apart from that, uh, I need some very important classes too. So, some area we, we can also be a very new area where we'll be talking about the communication protocols which are used for the lighting control. So, this lighting control protocol that I want to start. So, that's why next day I'll be talking about the design part and next classes will be starting the communication protocol different type of communication protocols which are used for sake of lighting control and the automation so this is a very important part of our lecture too so i need three to four maximum lectures 
so if you are not being able to manage your time then few of the live classes and few of the recorded classes we can go with whatever will be comfortable with you. okay okay sir anyway just forget about that now let us uh, talk about the i was talking about the cosine error just think about this is the play and here i have one detector so this just for our picture understand let me place a detector like that so this is my actual detector and the light is falling from somewhere from the here so this is the light is falling in a absolute normal direction okay and another light is falling with some angle so this angle what we have we can mention this particular uh, indicated angle but we have that is theta okay so yes. i should have uh, sadly i thought that this can i should clear to all of you because this is a common thing generally we do not mention but i think this is becoming very essential now to talk about that cosine correction because whatever you will see every time you will see so here my theta angle is there so if this is the angle theta so now we can assume this is a normal direction say intensity at normal direction is i n can you clear hear me clearly so there the intensity what i have that intensity is absolutely i n so here just think the intensity whatever we have here this is i n and this is i theta or e theta so if you talk about this say i don't know what so this is i n and this is basically so this is that means a normal direction intensity and this is we call i theta ideally can you see that yes sir so here in that part this is a normal direction intensity and that is what we have here directly and this is with the i theta angle for the theta so here ideally i theta should be equal to i n cos theta so this is an equation we are going to follow more and more whatever we may theta angle i theta that means the intensity at that point should be i n cos theta you can say e theta equal to e n cos theta to illuminance value but once we are measuring that the value are becoming less with respect to the e n cos theta or i n cos theta and more and more higher theta angle the values are becoming very 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 much deviated with the e n or i n cos theta why the thing is that here my sensor can measure that amount of energy which is falling normally so if your angle of incidence is becoming higher theta and theta so a big fraction of light is getting reflected from the surface so whatever component is going as a reflected component your sensor will not be capable to measure that your sensor can only measure that component which is directly falling over the sensor 
So what is getting absorbed by the sensor very precisely. So here, more and more theta angle, the reflection part will be more. So that's why more and more reflection means less amount will be absorbed by your sensor. So the value, whatever it's supposed to show, it will be looks a little bit less. And this value will increase with a higher incidence angle. So that is what we call cosine error. It's supposed to follow i theta equal to i n cos theta. But whatever i n cos theta value we are going to get, but actual measured value will be less than the i n cos theta. And this value will definitely change with the more and more theta angle. So higher theta angle, this value will be less. So that is the basic concept of uh, cosine error. Here, any doubt? No, Anyone? Now to get rid of this cosine error, what we are doing? So to get rid of the cosine error, this is a simple step which is getting adopted everywhere. There is a basically a sort of uh, cubical shape or sometimes a hemispherical or cylindrical shape. Cap is used. So what is that cap? This is basically a diffuse cap, what we call Lambertian surface. You know, for the Lambert surface, this uh, there is a very clear relationship between the intensity, major intensity and the flux, i theta equal to i equal to pi i n. So that, that's the relationship which is getting pi equal to pi i n. So that relationship is getting established for this case. And we know for the Lambertian surface, this is getting forced to maintain the relationship with i theta equal to i n cos theta. So this is the nature of that white gap. So once the light will uh, pass through that white gap, it is getting forced to maintain that cosine angle. So that's why here this angular issue, whatever we have, the higher an angle that can be solved. So that's why it is always getting forced to maintain that Lambert's nature. So that is why we call this is as a cosine correction. And this cosine correction is so important for our rest of the measurement. So here every time the cosine correction, so that's why you will be going to get all the lux meter mostly with the wide gap. So this is a diffuser we call it actually. It's a Lambertian surface or diffuser. This wide gap will provide us the this Lambertian nature. So that will help us to get rid of all the problems. So this is, uh, that's why for all the cases. Now come to the scotopic and photopic lux meter. So already I have mentioned that here we have a lux meter with a two bits head. What is the difference? Can anybody tell me? Can anybody tell me? Just try it out. To do average, I mean. No, here, here the two sensor, where is the difference between the sensor? What is the fundamental differences between the sensor? One sensor is a photopic one. That means a conventional lux meter we can use. So here, along with the raw sensor, here the silicon photodiode is used as a sensor. Along with the sensor, we have V lambda filter. I was talking about the V lambda filter much earlier. And here that is getting replaced in a photopic one that is getting replaced with the V dash lambda filter. So that's why the photopic and photopic lux meter actually works. Here for the measurement of luminance, we know luminance turns so far. This is basically solid angular flux in a given direction. That is what we call luminance. So this particular dedicated sensors are used to measure the luminance in a given direction. Then we have the Hagner Universal Photometer. So this is very interesting equipment. The name suggests that this dedicated photometer can help you to measure illuminance as well as luminance. So analog version of Hagner Universal Photometer we have. And the, you will be happy to know that the age of this one is quite old. I think during 1985 we bought it. So this is quite old. I think neither of you were then there. So, might be I was five years old. So, the Hagner Universal Photometer was basically used to take care of the measurement associated with the illuminance as well as luminance both. So, that's why we call it universal. This is how the luminance photometer works. So, every time the luminance star we have mentioned earlier, that is how much component of light is coming towards your eye. So, that's why the luminance meter works that you need to 
aim your sensor to the particular place or object where you are measured you want to measure the illuminance so that is what actually we always talking about sir in real life why yes. you use that yeah it's measure the luminance is the best example is uh, street lighting application so while in a real street you are driving once we will be talking about the street lighting design if you again comes on the last class the street lighting illuminates we have talked about mostly we want how much light is coming from the surface so think about whether you are walking down the street you are traveling through a car or might be you are driving your car or bicycle so every time this is very important here how you can see some object with respect to the background on a street so it is not expected that you will be sitting over a street and you will be going through some good books it is not expected what is our indoor indoor applications actually demand mostly in a street lighting application it is very important how much light is falling over the surface and getting reflected back towards your eye so you are in your street lighting application it is required that how much object light object and its background how much light difference is coming towards your eye which we call contrast i can just tell you that there is a very very bad practice we have i have seen i, I should not you know blame that much to our country but i have seen there is a very bad practice maintained somewhere maybe in our, my town also i should not directly mention anything that put lots of light in a street this is absolutely a non technical approach because this is not a flat place you are not going to play a match or neither you are going to go to a good story book fiction in a real estate here your application in a street to see some object with respect to the background that we have played here throughout the globe wherever i was being there and i have seen in europe in united states the specific street they want to maintain a very low level of light but they are ensuring that your object whatever will appear on the street should be clearly visible to the driver such a way he will be able to know that with respect to the background so that's why your background and your object yes the luminance will be considered how much is coming towards your eye it doesn't make sense i am lighting down my street lots of light i have given doesn't make sense my intention is that sometimes if you put a huge light your object visibility may get different so that's why try to minimize the light because it's a huge affair you know that throughout the year 365 days almost 12 hours your street lights are working so that's why it's a huge global expenditure of energy street light uh, lots of research are going on uh, all around the globe because there should be a clear tendency such a we can get rid of this amount of wastage so that is why we are the luminance meter we are using is it clear so using luminance meter here you will see what i am doing actually so an object is placed in a real road so so the road sample we prepared from our civil engineering department and we have focused the sensor towards this and we are supposed to measure how much luminance was coming from the background and from the surface we had some very interesting experiments i can't recall possibly might be few of your friends can the fourth year seniors can recall because i have taken them as a subject of my own ex experiment where i ask um, a group of students to drive a car near gate number 5 have you ever been there in the gate number 5 near gate number 5 yes sir just in front of the wt i hope during your long speech you have enjoyed that space a lot so that but i have taken that gate number 5 portion a portion of the street from the university just for my own experimentation where i ask the driver the group of drivers mostly the students who used to drive a car and some object was placed under a situation so the street lighting illuminates whatever that was duly designed by us which was controllable the color the intensity everything was controllable and we asked the driver to put easy head cap in brain you know this a uh, head gear a smart head gear they were wearing and that's how we have taken the data 
how fast that driver was being able to recognize any object in a street. So there the luminance measurement was very, very essential. So we read this in paper. Okay, possibly. Uh, uh, that's, that's the paper we already have. So that is a very, very interesting uh, thing. But here also we need to measure the luminance. I am telling you this type of measurements are very essential. You know why? Because street we can't avoid. We all need to use the street lighting application, right? So that's why it's very unfortunate that in India the street lightings are not that much a research article or neither that's a research topic. I have worked a lot on street light. I've tried because I, I think this is very much essential in Indian context that nobody thinks about. Once the question of street comes, let's flood it with lots of light. Otherwise, just make it off. So that is not a good approach. I think we need to take care of because everybody needs an application of street. Anyway, forget about it. Let's come back to our part. So this is a very interesting topic. I will be separately taking this part. This is why we call integrating sphere. So now we are going to talk about the measurement of luminous flux coming out from a source. This is a very vital topic in our curriculum. I will take 10, 15 more minutes. So will it be OK? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. We don't have any class at the moment. OK, thank you. So here now we are going to talk about the measurement of luminous flux. So what is luminous flux? The luminous flux is basically the distribution of light in all the directions. That is what we call luminous flux. So while we are going to talk about the luminous flux, the luminous flux can be measured in a two or three different ways. One is a very important way, that is using a Gonio photometer. And another one, what we call using an integrating sphere. So what is integrating sphere? That I am coming to all of you. But here, this is a sphere. I think you will be able to see the sphere. So it's, the diameter is 2.5 meter. And uh, as I'm standing there to tell you, show you that how big it is. So there are the two lobes of the sphere. The idea is that here we'll be mounting. So can you follow that car shaft? The uh, hanging arrangement is there. Can you see this? Yes, sir. So here the light will be mounted. We are supposed to measure how much luminous flux is coming out of the light. So that is what we call lumen out. Lumen is the unit of luminous flux. And how much portion is visible from the screen? There you can see this is basically a white coating. So with this white coating, a dedicated white coating, this is made with a system such a way all the light should travel within the sphere. So I'll be making one during measurements. I'll come out and the entire lobes, two different lobes or two hemispheres will be made closed to make a complete sphere. During that, the measurement will also be conducted. So while we are doing the experiment, it's a very common thing. The light will come out from the source and it will travel to the sphere. All the reflected and interreflected lights will travel to the sphere. And finally, a sensor will be mounted like that. So here you can see the basic geometry if we can talk about. So here is my source. Here is my sensor can you see the c that is a photometer head of sensor and in between that we have a baffle forget about this a okay so the idea is that we are forcing the light to travel to the sphere so the name suggests that integrating sphere that means it will do some sort of integration what type of integration basically it is going to integrate all the reflected and interreflected lights. So the function of the integrating sphere is to make the reflected and interreflected lights. All the reflected and interreflected lights will be considered. And the idea is that whatever reflected and interreflected will come, that will be duly integrated and finally will be able to reach to the sensor. Why so? Can anybody tell me? What is the relationship between the measured illuminance and luminous flux from the fundamental equation? Because here we are using a large meter and we are supposed to measure the light flux. What is the fundamental difference? Uh, 
anyone? Anyone? Sir, don't know. So here, basically, the fundamental equation says that how much flux is basically measured. If the measured illuminance is multiplied with the area of cross-section, we are going to get the illuminance. Uh, we are going to get the luminous flux because illuminance is lumen per meter square, lumen per area. Just one second, uh, my daughter is possibly saying something to me. Just wait for a while. Sorry. So, but, uh, that's uh, illuminance, whatever we are having here for the measurement of illuminance. Uh, if we can multiply the area of cross-section of the sensor, we will be going to get the luminous flux, but that is not the way how we can measure. If it is so simple, then why we are not doing that? I will put a light on, I will record the lux meter data, we will multiply the area with area and we will directly going to get the luminous value, two lux uh, or two luminous flux. Is it okay? Then where is the need? Uh, here is the need that we need to replace the direct lights only. So that means it can measure the luminous flux on this direction only. But we have never thought of the luminous flux in all the surrounding direction. But once we are talking about the luminous flux, repeatedly we have mentioned earlier that we should definitely talk about the surrounding. We never do talk about a single direction. For luminous intensity, for luminance, we are talking about the direction. But for the luminous flux, it's all around. So that's why, while we are talking about the measurement of luminous flux, in our last lecture, we have talked earlier. So you must go through that. There, here, we need to reflect all the direct lights. If I go by the calculation with a direct light only, measured illuminance into area, we will not be taking care of the light in all the other direction. Clear? So that's why here we are going for an indirect measurement. And we have introduced that baffle to shield all the direct lights. We are forcing all the lights to travel to the sphere. And finally, we'll reach to the sensor. You might be asking that, sir, if it's so, uh, so I have a dedicated one. If it is so, then I have another, uh, sorry. For this one, I have one experiment uh, on integrating sphere for you. So here, you might be thinking that if it's so, then why we need to always use this white coating inside? Using the white coating, what actually you can ensure? Are you getting my point? So. Here, using the white coating, what I'm ensuring, I, I have to ensure that all the lights after reflection and interreflection should reach to the sensor finally. So that's why whatever white coating we have is a special type of uh, white coating that is polytetra fluoroethylene with barium sulfate with some ratio that will ensure that to have a perfect flat diffuse surface. Now the question is that why diffuse surface? Because if we have a diffuse surface, then only we'll be able to ensure that after traveling that all the reflected and interreflected light will at least reach to the sensor. Otherwise, we can't ensure. Because the possibilities are very much that if it is a non-conventional, just a conventional white coating. Don't think it's a white coating. This is a special coating with polytetra fluoroethylene with barium sulfate just to make it as a Lambertian surface or perfect diffuse surface because in a perfect diffuse surface we know light reflected uniformly so that's how we can ensure the light whoever has gone there finally after lots of reflection will be able to reach to the sensor that is the basic idea 
on basis of which we are ensuring the integration of all reflected and interreflected lights. But instead of that, if we use a white coating, I can't know, I can't ensure that whatever light has reached here at all will be able to reach to the sensor or not. Okay, so that is what integrating sphere works. So this is the actual principle of integration of all reflected and interreflected lights. Now about the experiment. So using integrating sphere, already I have told you I can measure the luminous flux output from a source. We can measure the light output ratio and we can measure the balance factor. So that is what uh, we call integrating sphere based measurement. So how actually it works? So far any doubt? No, sir. Uh, this experiment is very simple. First, I'm going to put within the sphere already I've shown you, I am going to put a luminous flux transfer standard lamp. What is luminous flux transfer standard lamp? A standard lamp for which the luminous flux values are known. Now, this luminous flux transfer standard lamps are getting replaced with another one. So, that is my test for which we are supposed to know the luminous flux. So, the test lamp. Test, test lamp. So, why we are measuring that using the test lamp for which the luminous flux is known, I'll be putting that inside the sphere. The step is that first I will put the standard lamp, I'll make it on and I'll record the data from the lux meter. Say the lux meter reading is capital ES. A stands for standards and E, you know, that's how we, we, we the legend of lux is used. And small, now here, once we are going to use my test lamp, I'll replace the standard lamp with the test lamp, make it on, and I'll record the data again. That's what value we are getting. That is capital E T. Suffix T indicates the test lamp. So that's how the both the lux meter readings are there. And for the standard lamp, luminous flux is known. We haven't changed the entire sphere. So we are going by the simple proportionality constant equation. So that is what that is. Phi T is the lumen output of the lamp. That is a known taste lamp, which are supposed to know. The phi S value is already known to me. ET by ES, this is a unitary method. ET is the already I mentioned the last meter reading when the taste lamp is on and last meter reading when the standard lamp is on. So that ratio will give us the value of lumen. Okay, so this is a simple unitary method. Until and unless the sphere geometry is changed, this, this method is very much popular to do the measurement. Now the only small thing with which today I'm going to conclude that here what is going to happen if my test lamp and standard lamp differs. The question is that how can I select the standard lamp. Is it like that any standard lamp, whatever is available in um, in my uh, database, I can use it comfortably? Do you think that? Anyone? No, it's not. Because here we very precisely know while we are going to select my standard lamp, first of all, we need to measure the spectral power distribution of my test lamp, the SPD value of my test lamp. So once the SPD value is known, with respect to the SPD value, I'll be able to select the standard lamp. So the first, once you have given me a test lamp, the first step I'm using a spectroradiometer, I'll be measuring the SPD value of my test lamp. So once the SPD value of test lamp is known, accordingly, I'm going to select my standard lamp. Okay, so that's, if the SPD values are matches, okay, if it doesn't match, then we need to use at least the color temperature matching. The color temperature of both should at least match. So that is how using the integrating sphere, we can measure the lumen output of the lamp. So with this today, I want to conclude. So if you have any query, feel free to ask me. In our next class, we'll be finishing a small uh, this uh, intensity measurement, Bonio photometric measurement is still left. Maybe a recorded form, I can send you that. And design class, I want to make it live because I need a sort of interaction with all of you.
So that's why the next week I'll be going to take the design class and the communication protocol where we'll be talking about the interesting even our today's internet is CPIP IPv6 protocol with that I will be talking about explicitly. So, so far whatever today we have discussed any query feel free to ask otherwise we can uh, finish our today's lecture. So just last slide, what is the auxiliary lamp? Right, right, right. I was purposefully waiting for that case. Actually, the auxiliary lamp is the lamp which is used. Say, we have already talked about the color of taste and standard lamp, how we can match, right? But we haven't mentioned what is the what will happen about their physical shape and size. Say, my taste one is a tubular in shape, maybe a four feet tube. Uh, whereas my standard one is a small circular in shape. So if I'm going to put that within the sphere, there will be a sort of absorption which will appear there within. This is called self-absorption area. So that's why the auxiliary lamp is introduced. So what is the role of the auxiliary lamp? The auxiliary lamp will be placed somewhere here. I will put a, my test lamp, not going to make it on. The auxiliary lamp will be made on. Note down the last meter reading. Now replace the test lamp with the standard lamp, but don't make it on. Only make your auxiliary lamp on. Under this condition, whatever reading will be shown by your last meter, that is also because of the self absorption. Now take the ratio of that too. So that's why small ES and small ET you have seen that I have used as a set of correction factor, which is basically. Once my standard lamp is within the sphere, but it is not made on, only the small low wattage auxiliary lamp placed within the sphere that is made on, and the lux meter reading is recorded. That is yes, small yes. And small ET, once my test lamp is placed within the sphere, but that is not made on, only the auxiliary lamp again made on, and the lux meter reading is recorded. That two ratio will be helping us to nullify if because of their physical shape and size mismatch, if there are some sort of errors appearing in our measurement, so that can be calculated like this. Okay, so that is the function of the auxiliary lamp. That is also inside, we place within the sphere wall. That means the sphere inside the wall. So that is what we call auxiliary lamp and its function. Thank you, sir. Anything else? So can we uh, conclude today here? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So